Hey everyone, uh, today's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be, think, um, a little, possibly more intense, uh, maybe a little more uh, pointed. Uh, we're going to talk about the cross. And we're in the middle of a series called Follow. It's all about what it means to, to follow Jesus and what that looks like in our lives and why we would even want to do it in the first place. And it's all rooted in one event, the cross of Jesus. So here's the deal. In the life and the belief of a Christian, the most pivotal moment in the entirety of the universe is when Jesus dies on a cross for the sins of the world. But I think maybe that we have a, an unfinished understanding of the cross and what it really means for us and what it means to us. And really, if someone was going to say to you, what's the deal with the cross? Tell me exactly what happened there. Uh, could you do it? So today, that's what I want to talk about. What happens when someone's crucified? Why did Jesus uh, go to the cross? And, and what does that mean for us now? So, so what happens on a cross? I think first we need to work out our understanding of what the cross was and, and what crucifixion was. And, uh, and to be really honest, uh, this was a pretty uh, difficult subject to research. It might be difficult to, to actually hear. So I want to warn you ahead of time that I'm going to talk a bit about the history of the practice of crucifixion, as well as what the human body goes through uh, during that process. I'm not taking it lightly, uh, but I want to have a full understanding of it. I want to have a full understanding of what Jesus did. So fair warning to you if you uh, are squeamish about this stuff or maybe you have young kids around, we're actually going to head in that direction. The practice of crucifying people, hanging them on a cross as a method of death and execution is likely created uh, by the Assyrian dynasty around 600 years before Jesus. But it really became the execution method of choice by the Roman Empire. One historian said that the Romans didn't create crucifixion, but they sure did perfect it. Crucifixion is a method of execution that was so bad, so painful, so shameful to be put through that Rome wouldn't even do it to any of their own citizens unless they're considered a traitor to the country. It was reserved for political rebels, enemies of the state, and the process was meant to become the ultimate deterrent for potential rebel activity. It combined the highest possible amount of pain with the slowest possible process of death. It included the humiliation of the individuals who were being punished. And really, Jesus wasn't the only person in history to be crucified. It's actually used a fair bit. Different historians make note of uh, bodies of crucified people lining the roads towards cities in some instances. One Roman is recorded uh, of crucifying over 2,000 people in one mass murder. First, the victim was scourged. They were whipped uh, with whips that had little metal balls and bits of bone attached to the threads. That would create massive pain and blood loss and expose the inner parts of the body. And at that point, victims suffered something called hypovolemic shock, which is where their body was trying to pump blood through it that wasn't there, through the blood loss. And it happened and causes the body to go into shock. And so even before the cross, the person is in critical condition. From there, the victims would have to carry their own cross beam, the, the horizontal beam, to the location of the crucifixion. And there, their hands were nailed to the cross between the palm of the hand and the lower wrist. And most of our Bibles translate the word hand here, and that's okay, because the entire hand and the area of the wrist were encompassed in the word of that language in that day. Nails are five to seven inches long, and they would crush a median nerve, which was brutally painful. And once nailed to the cross beam, that cross beam was attached to the vertical beam. And the feet were nailed to that, again, going through a major nerve. And the body hangs there, and it begins to dislocate the shoulders. From there, death uh, happens slowly by suffocation. The way the body is held, it forces the victim to push up on their feet that are nailed, or pull up on their arms which are nailed to take a breath. And to do that over and over and over again. Eventually, exhaustion or shock makes that process too much, and cardiac arrest begins, and the individual dies. So that's bad. Uh, the pain, the process, uh, the process of death on the cross is brutal. And Jesus wasn't the only person who died on that cross, though. History is littered with thousands of people who have been killed by oppressive rulers by way of the cross. So why is this one man who was crucified important? Even better, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? If he's truly the Son of God, there's probably something different that could have happened, you'd think, right? So to understand the why of what Jesus went through, I think we got to go to Scripture. I have a section in mind here for you that I want you to keep in mind as well from 1 Peter. 
Uh, this book, found in the New Testament, it holds the testimony and the teachings of the Apostle Peter, the same one who denied even knowing Jesus while Jesus was facing the prospect of crucifixion. So here's what Peter says in 1 Peter 2, verse 24. It says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. So what Peter does here is he actually ties his teachings about Jesus, that he bore our sins in his own body, to another verse found way back in the Old Testament in Isaiah 53. Speaking to a Jewish audience, Peter says, you were like sheep going astray, because he knows that that would call to mind the famous passage from that Old Testament. And the Jewish people were incredibly familiar with this passage. So here's what he would have brought to memory. This verse in Isaiah 53, it says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We are all like sheep that have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. These two sections of scripture give us a bit of an idea of what's actually happening on the cross. Uh, Peter tells us that Jesus bore our sins in his body. And from Isaiah, we learn that he, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions, which is our unlawful choices, and he was crushed for our iniquities, which is our immoral behavior. And I think there's more to it. Colossians uh, chapter 2, verse 13 and 14 tell us that when we were dead in our sins, he, Jesus, forgave our sins, having canceled the debt of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And so we understand now that the Bible teaches us that Jesus on the cross took the guilt of our sins, of our transgressions, our iniquities, and of our rebellion, all of our mistakes, and all of it is placed onto Jesus. Someone else accepted the responsibility and the consequences of my sin. Wow. It's not actually unheard of, of that idea in the Bible, the fact that someone else can pay for the consequences of your sin. In Leviticus 10, God makes a provision for the nation of Israel in the form of a sin offering to take away the guilt of the entire community. If you make the sacrifice, the sin of the community was forgiven. And in Leviticus 16 in your Old Testament, the Day of Atonement is introduced. And atonement means reparation for a wrong, means, means paying the cost or bearing the burden. And what would happen is on that Day of Atonement, the high priest Aaron would put his hands on a goat and confess the sins of Israel and symbolically transfer the guilt of the sin, the transgressions, the iniquities, and the rebellion to that goat. Now, did the little goat do anything wrong? No, it's a goat. But it took the weight and the guilt of the sin symbolically on its head. And in the same way, Jesus takes the guilt of the sin, transgressions, iniquities, and rebellion of, ours, of ourselves onto him. Later on in Peter's letter, he says more about this. He says that, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. That's uh, 1 Peter 3.18. So I think we're kind of getting the idea. Why did Jesus go to the cross? Because as the sinless one, he could pay the price for those that were sinful. The one who made no act of rebellion placed his life on the line to pay the price of the rebels. And Jesus was tried as a political activist rebel. And he was trialed for, for being a rebel, for leading a revolt and, and being a leader of a rebellion. But there's no rebellion in his heart. No sin on his hands. So Jesus dies for us. He takes or he bears the sin on himself. And sometimes we don't like to hear the next part. But that sin that Jesus took upon himself, that's your sin. It's my sin. Romans 5.10 says that while we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. And just before that, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says God demonstrates his own love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So why did Jesus have to go to the cross? Why did he die on the cross? Go back to that story of the day of atonement with the goat and where the goat takes the, and bears the sin of the people. Jesus does the same for us once and for all. Where a goat or a lamb was needed every year, Jesus makes the complete sacrifice because he had never sinned and could make that perfect sacrifice on behalf of you and me. Going back to 1 Peter 3.18, it says Christ also suffered once for sins. In 1 John 2, 2, it says that he is the propitiation or the full appeasement or payment for our sins. 
and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In Hebrews 10, uh, 12 to 14, the author writes, when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he, Jesus, sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The sacrifice of Christ was sufficient one-time payment for the sins of the world. That while we had sin, transgressions, iniquities, and rebellion in our heart, Christ made the sacrifice to cover it all. So what does that mean now? Well, in Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ, he interviews a doctor named Dr. Alexander Metherell. And after getting a full picture of the understanding of the process of crucifixion and the pain and what happens to the body, he has to ask, why on earth would someone willingly go through that? And so here's the response from Dr. Alexander Metherell. He said, Jesus knew what was coming and he was willing to go through it because this was the only way he could redeem us by serving as our substitute and paying the death penalty that we deserve because of our rebellion against God. That was his whole mission in coming to earth. So when you ask what motivated him, I suppose the answer can be summed up in one word, and that would be love. So in the context of following Jesus, what do we do with this? When we have a full understanding of what happens on the cross and what it means and, and what happens to the body and the person there, are you prepared to follow the command of Jesus where in Matthew 16, he speaks to his followers and he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. All of a sudden, that's a big ask. But we know that following Jesus calls us to deny ourselves. It calls us to sacrifice. It means that we live in a way that reflects that someone died for us. We are called to live our lives in a way that remembers someone gave up their life for ours. What does it mean for us now? I think there's an important part of what Christ did that we need to remember. Yes, he died on the cross, but no, he did not stay dead. See, the Bible tells us that three days after his, death on the uh, after his death on the cross, he rose again, and in doing so, he declared to the world that he is more powerful than all of your sin. In rising from death, he declares to evil that it is defeated. In rising from the dead, he declares to us that there's no height or depth or principality or power in this world that will even separate you from the love of God. He declares that the rebellion has been taken care of. The sin has been paid for. He declares it is finished. So here's what it means now. Because of the sacrifice on the cross, the debt is paid. Because of the resurrection of Christ, death, evil, and rebellion, they're all defeated. And now you can make a choice. And God makes it so that you are presented with a choice and you are free to make it. That Christ has made the sacrifice for you and he doesn't want to force it upon you. You can choose to accept it or not. But that free gift of Christ's sacrifice provides payment for, for sin. It's an act of forgiveness that is available to you, an act of grace that is given to you. If you accept the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, you accept his resurrection too. When you accept the resurrection, you accept that everything changes, including you. And so we make this decision to follow him, first in our heart and then in our deeds. In our hearts, we put him in charge and make him Lord of our entire life. Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and you are saved. See, accepting the sacrifice of Jesus and taking up your cross means uh, following him and, and putting Jesus in charge of your life now. You set aside the ways and the things that you think and the way that you think your life should go. You lay down your desires because Jesus said that we must deny ourselves first and then take up our cross. Look, process of crucifixion is brutal. And that's why I explained a bit of it. Just because what Jesus did for you and, and did for me is almost unimaginable. The cross is the pivotal moment in the history of humankind for the Christian faith because what happens there affects everything. It's an offer of grace. It's an offer of forgiveness that collides with the great and undeserved sacrifice of Jesus. The cross is where sin and rebellion are dealt with in a way that the rebels are shown great love. And Billy Graham explained it with this thought. 
He said that the cross shows us the seriousness of our sin, but it also shows us the immeasurable love of God. Let's pray. Uh, God, I know that there are people watching here today and, and you're working in their hearts. And Lord, we're thankful for your sacrifice on the cross that uh, there was a payment made for us, that you did what we could not. So Lord, we trust you uh, today that your payment was good, that it was full. And Lord, for the sacrifice, we say thank you. And Lord, for those of you that are, that are watching, um, for your children, for your people that are watching and, and this is hitting them heavy or hitting them hard today, Lord, I pray you would show them the depths of your love that extend even farther than that. Lord, we're so thankful that there is no height or depth, no principality, nor power. Nothing can separate us from your love. This is a God we trust you as the God who saves and redeems and does great things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. God bless you.
Christ, my Lord. 